There we go. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. It is Sunday, July the 12th, and 7 o'clock in the morning, the odd day of the week when we get together. Most days are 10 a.m. and 7 a.m. or 7.30 or 45 on Sundays, whenever we can get to it, depending on the schedule. But uh, we're starting a brand new book today. We finished Nehemiah just yesterday, and so today we're jumping back to the New Testament. We're going back and forth between Old and New Testaments, and uh, we're going to do the book of Ephesians this week. It's only six chapters, so we will finish up uh, on Friday with this book. So I'm excited about it. It's one of the Pauline epistles. When I give you things like that, term, terminology and different words to describe, I want to define them for you. I don't want to just take for granted that you know what that means. To be a Pauline epistle simply means that it was written by the Apostle Paul. Uh, something else to bring out is we hear Ephesians, Galatians, Philippians, Corinthians, Colossians, Thessalonians. What does that mean? It means they were written to the people in those cities and the church in those cities. And generally, these uh, cities only had one church. They hadn't gotten as sophisticated as us where we can't get along, so we split and form other churches. And so when you talk about the book of Ephesians, what you're talking about is the Christians in the church at Ephesus. The city is called Ephesus. So just like we're in the state of Michigan in the United States, our citizens are called Michiganders. Uh, Florida citizens are called Floridians. So if uh, the citizens of Ephesus are Ephesians. And so we're going to go ahead and cover chapter number one today. It's 23 verses. Many times these uh, first chapters of these smaller epistles, they will be a bit introductory. <clears throat> They're, they, they can be a little confusing sometimes. And what I want to encourage you to do is don't overthink it. Take the Bible at its word and just move along through it, almost like uh, how a, a stream or a river flows over and around the rocks, and, and that's how you want to ride out these chapters. Now, the Lord may give you deeper understanding of some of these things later on, but uh, if we're not careful, we'll get hung up and concerned about some things. Uh, in the book of Ephesians, chapter number one, the word predestination is mentioned. And so this is where you can easily get sidetracked into some doctrine or teaching that's not biblical. And so we're going to pray and then jump right in to Ephesians chapter number one. Father, would you bless our study time this morning? Give us your mind as we look into this new book, an exciting book and a helpful book. Please guide our thinking. We love you and ask this in Christ's name. Amen. All right. <clears throat> Verse number one, Ephesians chapter one. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. So just like uh, the, the header of a letter and then the signature of the letter, we're told who this is being written to, and we're told who it's being written by. So it's being written by Paul, who is an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. So this is where I'm saying, you know, don't take some of this stuff for granted, but don't overthink it. We know that Paul is an apostle, and he's in that position because of the will of God. And then who is he writing to? To the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Now, that's the same group of people. The saints at Ephesus are the faithful in Christ, and God's people ought to be faithful people. They shouldn't be people that are hot one day and cold the next and cold one week and hot the next. Let's just be consistent. You think of the tortoise and the hare, that old fairy tale and, and how the hare was inconsistent. He'd run real fast sometimes and he's taking the nap the next time you notice, but the tortoise is just there plodding along, doing what he needs to do every single day. Verse number two, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. So he is uh, uh, wishing them two things, grace and peace. Grace 
is defined as unmerited favor, favor that we don't deserve but comes our way. And so he he wishes that for the people of Ephesus. Uh, then he wishes peace to them. You know, peace, the uh, opposite of conflict, the opposite of fear. And so those things come from God and from Christ. Jesus Christ is called the Prince of Peace. So if you're looking for peace in your life, spend time with Christ. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Right now, we've been going through some tumultuous times here because of the COVID-19 situation and, and all that's been going on with the rioting in the streets and the protest marches and the news cycle is just absolutely crazy. <clears throat> and it, it can make you think, boy, you know, I don't know how secure I am in this world. Well, I hate to bear the bad news to you. Uh, you're not very secure in this world. However, with Jesus Christ as your Savior and by your side, nothing outside of the will of God can get to you and make an impact in your life. So he wishes them grace and peace. Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So the next several verses are going to be telling us about who we are positionally in Christ, the benefits that are in our life because of Christ. So he says, blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there you've got God who is the creator and judge, but then Father who is more the compassionate side of the relationship. And what he's saying here is it's our Lord Jesus Christ which makes the Father, our God, and our Father as well, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So just as God and, and the Heavenly Father is the God and Father of Christ, he's also ours then as well. And so whereas before, the high priest was the one who intermediated between the people and God. Now Christ is that mediator, and we can come to God on our own. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So God knew from the foundation of the earth due to his omniscience, that means all-knowing, he knew that we would be his children. He knew that we would accept and receive Christ as Savior. And so from the foundation of the world, he knew uh, that, that we would be his and that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So our, our, our position is a holy position and a blameless position. That's not due to us, however. It's due to the Lord Jesus. It's because of Christ's imputed righteousness. Righteousness is goodness or holiness, and imputed means given to. So when we trust Christ as Savior, he gives us holiness and righteousness, his holiness and righteousness, which is a perfect holiness and righteousness. Verse 4, nope, 5. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children, by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. So God in time past, of course, for God there is no time. God is eternal. There is no past. There is no present. There is no future. He exists on a plane outside of time. We can't even comprehend <clears throat> the way that things work for God. And it says that, that he decided long ago that we would become his children. And <clears throat> let's see here, that we would receive the adoption of children. That means we belong to someone else, but now we're going to belong to him. We were without a father and he would take us in and he would become our father. <clears throat> by Jesus Christ, and it's through the Son of God that all of this occurs, to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. This is what God willed for us. He desired that we would become his. Verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, 
wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Because of Christ, we're now accepted. It's sort of like you trying to get into a place that you need uh, a membership card to be a part of, but then someone vouches for you. That's all right. He's with me. Come on in. And so when we try to approach the Father, the Father says, wait a minute. You know, do you have the right to approach me? And then the Lord Jesus says, he's with me, Father. He can come in. Verse number seven, in whom, talking about Christ now, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So redemption through his blood, it's the blood of Jesus Christ, that sacrifice made that buys us back. Uh, that redeems us, where redemption means to uh, take the value out of or take ownership of the value. And so the blood of Christ affords that to us. And then forgiveness of sins. Our sins have to be dealt with. We have to have them forgiven by God. And it's through Christ that these things happen. And it's according to the riches of his grace. So again, grace is unmerited favor. We don't deserve forgiveness. We don't deserve that Christ would shed his blood for us, but he did it for us anyhow. Verse 8, <clears throat> wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. So the, the gifts of wisdom, the gifts of prudence are all part of the package deal of being in Christ. Verse 9, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. Once you become a child of God, you realize the purpose that God has for your life. I was 15 before I uh, got my salvation nailed down and accepted Christ, and I had no idea what to do with my life before that time. And then after salvation, it immediately became clear to me what God wanted me to do and why he had me here on this planet. Verse number 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ. And he's talking about future events here, future for us. God is doing these things and he's sending Christ to the earth. He's allowing Christ to be crucified and die and resurrected so that he might put all of us together, those who would accept Christ, predestinated to become his children. He uses all of that to accomplish his good will. What it's saying is, the redemption plan of God, the shed blood of Christ, the forgiveness of sins, that's all a part of God's plan and God's will. Verse number 13, in whom, speaking of Christ, ye also trusted. After that, ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that, ye believed ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So when we accept Christ, when we come in faith to Christ, the Holy Spirit seals our decision. A uh, man explained it to me once when I was struggling with salvation and could I lose it or do I have it as a possession forever? And he took a bottle of, of soda pop and there was some pop in it and he closed the lid real tight and he said, I've now sealed this bottle. And he dumped it upside down and nothing leaked out of it and he shook it around and nothing came out. He said, your, your salvation or your position in Christ is exactly like this soda pop and the Holy Spirit has sealed you in. You can't get out. And therefore, once you accept Christ, nothing, excuse me, and no one can take that away from you. Verse number 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. And that earnest means goodwill. Uh, when you buy a house and you, you find the house you want, you make an offer on that house and you say, I want to buy it. And the sellers say, well, we'll sell it to you. 
but we want some earnest money because you're going to get an inspection. You're going to uh, set up appointments at the closing office and the title company. So we want some money down that proves you're serious about this. And if you back out of the deal, we're going to keep that money. That's called earnest money. It's money put down to guarantee you'll follow through on your actions. And what this is saying is God's earnest money or guarantee is the sealing of the Holy Spirit. We will be in heaven someday because of the guarantee that the Holy Spirit's put on our life. Verse number 15, wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you making mention of you in my prayers. And so now Paul is shifting gears here a little bit. He's getting a little personal with the people. He said, I've heard of your faith. I've heard about your church. I've heard about what you're doing. I'm excited about that. And so I thank God for you and I pray for you all the time. Verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of his glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ, which he raised from the dead, and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, in every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. I know, I've just read five or six verses straight on through. Paul is a master of run-on sentences. He will just go and go and go. So let's briefly uh, recap these things here. Uh, I don't know where we even left off. Uh, verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. He says, look, I want you to know your purpose here. I want you to know why you're here. I want you to know what's available to you through Christ. And then he starts talking about Christ here, uh, which he wrought in Christ, raised him from the dead, set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality. He's saying, look, you serve the God of the universe. You serve uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, who the Father himself ordained the purpose for his coming to earth and, and why he would come and how that would affect you positionally. And Christ, of course, is above all and head of all, and all things are under his feet. He's saying, look, you belong to Jesus, and that is the greatest thing that could ever happen in this universe because the God of heaven, the Father of all, and his only begotten Son, Jesus, to whom is given all power above the heavens and under the heavens and in the heavens, you belong to him. You are in him positionally, and he's going to show you his will for your life and his your part of uh, your how your life plays into his part in his will in all that he wants to accomplish. So these chapters can be a little bit complicated, especially these first ones, and you got to break them down and work your way through it, but they're not too awful difficult and they're not too challenging. In fact, I hate to say this because each phrase does give you a little different nuance here. They can be somewhat redundant, so don't think you're necessarily missing anything. I think more than anything, we sometimes take for granted uh, what certain things mean, and so we'll just read through them. Grace be to you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we just blow through something like that rather than taking time to work through it phrase by phrase or even word by word. But that's the introduction to the Ephesians. Paul coming to this church who they said, by the way, was part of the body of Christ, uh, is the body of Christ. And he's saying, look, this is what's happened to you. You've been saved. You're now a Christian. You're a child of God. And God has a purpose and a plan for your life and for your existence. And we're going to 
help you find that purpose and plan. And that ought to be the case for all of us. We're not put here for our own uh, endeavors. We're not put here to satisfy our, the lusts of our flesh. We're put here to serve the God who's planted us on this earth and do the will that he has for us. All right, that's chapter number one of Ephesians. We'll cover this Monday through Friday this week, tomorrow morning back at 10 a.m. It is Sunday morning. I hope that you're on your way to church somewhere. If you don't have a church home, we stream on Facebook at Lighthouse Baptist Church uh, of Flint, Michigan. If you'll search for that in Facebook, you'll find our church. You can watch our live stream service, 10 a.m. for the morning service preaching on the subject just one this morning. And then tonight at 545, we'll be back again. So if you can't uh, join us locally, then uh, feel free to watch us online. If you are in the local area, please come and see us. We'd love to have you this morning. God bless you. Have a great Lord's Day.